anything that you see or hear, please ask when the service is over. If you want to know why we do what we do, if you want to know why we teach what we teach, please ask. We've said it many times before and we'll say it again that if we teach anything here, we do so by the authority of the scriptures. Colossians 3 and verse 17, Peter would say, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. 1 Peter 4 and verse 11, giving glory unto God. That's what we do. So if you have any questions about anything, please don't hesitate to ask. If you don't understand something, please also don't hesitate to ask. If, if we misrepresent something in any way, don't hesitate to, to, to let us know if, if I have uh, misspoken. Believe that or not, I have actually misspoken before. Um, I know I speak really slow, um, so every once in a while something will come out that isn't actually the intent, so uh, don't feel bad to ask me if something is uh, confusing to you. We're studying the book of Acts, and in Acts chapter 6 we find ourselves in preparations for the work that Philip is doing, excuse me, that Stephen is doing, and we're essentially setting the scene, we're setting the context for the next chapter in which the great persecution comes against the church because of the stoning of Stephen. Well, who is Stephen? Well, Stephen is one of the individuals we've been studying the last couple of weeks. He's one of these individuals in the Jerusalem church. He was one of those that was uh, an individual that would be, uh, the, the apostles would lay hands on him, and he would be a minister, a servant in that church. And he was uh, one of uh, a few individuals who was chosen to help with the, the ministration to the Grecian widows. But what we actually see happening is we see that Stephen was incredibly effective as a preacher. And we, we'll, we'll see that a little bit more tonight um, as we're, we're looking at the, or excuse me, tomorrow night as we see uh, some of that and actually last week when we go back over what we've studied so far. So that's kind of where we find ourselves. So let's back up to Acts 1 and let's do our review. We'll t try to touch on a few things that maybe we haven't touched on in a little while in doing our review just to keep our minds uh, fresh on where we find ourselves. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 1, we have uh, the, essentially we have the apostles waiting in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, right? That's why they're there. Luke 24 and verse 49, that they were to wait in Jerusalem. They would tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. Now, if you're in Acts 1, why don't you look at Acts chapter 1, and why don't you look at verse number 6. We mentioned that a little bit this morning <clears throat> in our Bible study. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, and notice the question that the apostles asked the Lord after the Lord had died and risen again and before he ascended to his father. Notice that there was still a very flagrant misunderstanding of the nature of the kingdom. The apostles asked the question, will thou now restore the kingdom unto Israel? Asking the question as if, Lord, are you going to now make this a, a, a great nation again, a great physical nation? Are you going to remove us now from the oppression of Rome? Are you going to make us, are you going to get us out from under their thumb? Remember this morning we talked about that, the significance of Jesus uh, being the seed of David? You know, J Jesus was the seed of Abraham, Galatians 3.16, but he was also the seed of David, wasn't he? He was of David's lineage. He's the son of David. Do you know the significance of David? David was, is David the same character as Abraham? No, they differ in many ways. One of which, David was the king of Israel, but not only was he a king, he was a conqueror. He was a conqueror. We reference 1 Chronicles chapter 22 when God tells Abraham, or when God tells uh, uh, David, you're not going to build me a house because you're a bloody man. You've shed much blood. He would allow his son Solomon to build him a house. And of course, that would be the antitype of Christ building the church. But the point I'm making is these individuals had a misunderstanding. They were looking for the Messiah to be a, a conquering king. They were looking at, at the Messiah to be this man who would come in the likeness of David. And he would be someone who actually uh, released them from the oppression of Rome and instituted a, a powerful earthly kingdom in which there would be all of the things that we enjoy in the spiritual kingdom that we're now in. They missed it, didn't they? Sure they did. So don't feel bad if every once in a while you misunderstand something. Because they did. These were the apostles. They misunderstood this after his death. They misunderstood this after, if you notice in John's account, John 21, you know what Peter says when Jesus died? I go a fishing. Well, you know what? I was convinced he was the son of God, but he's not here. 
He's, they killed him. How could they kill the Messiah? I'm going to go fishing and just... This, I'm, I'm so stressed out, I don't know what to do. And then you notice when Peter saw the Lord, he jumped out of the boat and swam to him. Do you think that maybe they doubted? You know what? Maybe he wasn't the Son of God. Sure they did. They had misunderstandings right up to this point. I believe Peter had this misunderstanding until he was clothed with this power from on high and the Holy Spirit revealed through him the nature of the spiritual kingdom, which is the church in Acts 2. But up until this point, they had no idea. Else, why did they ask the question? So there's these fundamental misunderstandings that they have. And, and I'll tell you, um, I mentioned that because I mentioned this morning, I was watching a YouTube video of a, a very, very nice, very knowledgeable, very articulate Jewish man. And he was, uh, he was answering the question that was posed to him, why do modern day Jews reject Jesus as the Messiah? And I thought it would be interesting. And it was about a four minute video. So I watched it and I wrote down the four points he made. And I'm going to answer those, which I've already answered Three, but it doesn't matter that I'm answering them because God's word has already answered those points. And one of the points was when the Messiah comes, he's going to accomplish his mission. They're not going to kill him. Do you see what they're thinking? They were thinking of David. They missed it totally. In Isaiah 53, when it talks about him being a, uh, uh, an individual who nobody would, would notice, you, he's nothing to look at, guys. He is, he is nothing of any significance. He's not of a fair countenance as David was. He's not of the tribe of Benjamin. He's not Saul, head and shoulders taller than anyone else. He's unbecoming. You would not think that he is anything special to look at him. And they killed him. That can't be the Messiah because the Messiah is supposed to bring peace on earth and a physical kingdom restored to Israel. Well, that's exactly what the apostles thought and they were dead wrong too. The truth of the matter is the Bible emphatically teaches that Jesus was the Son of God. Acts 2 and verse 22, you men of Israel hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God raised up. Acts 2, 22 through 24. So I thought it was interesting anyway, and I'm going to present that. I don't know if I'm going to present it in lesson format or have a good discussion for a couple of weeks on one of our Bible studies, but I thought it would be interesting to go through those points and answer those points together. But the apostles had the same misunderstanding, didn't they? Acts 1.6. That's, that's what it means. Lord, are you going to now restore the glory of the, the physical kingdom of Israel? Are you going to be like we were before? Do you remember when they, when they asked for a king in 1 Samuel chapter 8? They wanted to, be, they wanted to have a, an earthly king so that they could be just like everybody else. Isn't that, what, isn't that what the church wants now? The church doesn't like the exclusive nature of New Testament Christianity, John 14, 6. The church doesn't like the exclusive nature of the authority of Christ, Acts 4, 12. So the church wants to be like everybody else. Oh, make us a king so we can be like everybody else. God says, go ahead and do it, Samuel, because they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. God was the king of Israel. So he gave him Saul, Right? Then he took Saul off, gave him David. Then he took David off, gave him Solomon. Then he split the kingdom under Solomon's son and gave uh, ten tribes to Jeroboam and two to Rehoboam. And from thence forward, there was never a united kingdom again. There was always a northern tribe of Israel and the southern tribe of Judah. And they went into captivity at different times and they were never united again. And they asked the question, God, will you now restore this glorious kingdom? No. That's not the kind of kingdom we're talking about, is it? John 18, verse 36, Jesus would say, My kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my servants would fight. Doesn't that answer that Jewish question once and for all? Anyway, all right, let's move forward. Acts 2. Acts 2 is the beginning of the kingdom, isn't it? You know what Daniel 7 says? In Daniel chapter 7, and verse 13 and 14, where we see an image. We see the ancient of days, that's God. And we see the Son of Man. And the Son of Man would, would go to the Ancient of Days. And when He would go to the Ancient of Days, He would receive certain things. He would receive glory and a dominion and a kingdom. You remember in Daniel chapter 2, as Daniel interprets the dream for Nebuchadnezzar, and he sees that statue with the four different materials making up the statue. And he would interpret that, and he would say Babylon, and he would say Medo-Persia, and he would say Greece, and he would say Rome, and he would say the days of those kings, the eternal kingdom would come into effect, and it will never pass away. And did the kingdom of God, was it not established during the, the days of Rome? 
Is it AD 30 in Palestine in the, the power, the clutches of imperial Rome? Sure is. And that's when it started. Didn't Jesus say, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not stand against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Matthew 16, 18, and verse 19. Didn't Paul say in Colossians 1, 13, Who has delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption. Where is redemption found? Ephesians 1, 3, in Christ. He says, in the kingdom we have redemption. Well, that's to be in Christ if you're in the kingdom. Didn't John say that in Revelation 1 verse 9? That he was a fellow partaker of the tribulation and the kingdom of God. Yes or no? Yes, sir. Didn't Mark 9 and verse 1 say, Jesus record, Mark recorded Jesus' words that said, There will be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God coming with power. Well, Acts 2 is the fulfillment of Mark 9 1. Mark it down. Power was demonstrated. If you want references for power, you can see Acts 1, 4, and 5, Acts 1, 8. You can see Luke 24, verses 48 and 49. You can reference also passages such as Acts 4 and verse 33. The power demonstrated. The coming of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles, that was power demonstrating. This is the beginning of what was spoken of. This is the kingdom of God coming with power. How did they gain entrance into the kingdom? Repent and be baptized, everyone, you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, right? Peter preached Jesus. He started in Joel's prophecy, Joel 2, 28 through 32. Then he went to Psalm 16. Then he preached that Jesus was the Christ and you crucified him. Men and brother, what shall we do? Say the sinner's prayer. No, sir. Men and brother, what shall we do? Accept Jesus into your heart. No, sir. Men and brother, what shall we do? You don't have to do anything. God's already chosen who's lost and who's saved. No, sir. What should we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for their remission of sins. That's not hard. <clears throat> Acts 3. Acts 3 is the example that Paul would say in Romans chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation unto all those who believe to the Jew first. The gospel went to the Jews first. Didn't that who Jesus went to? Jesus went to the lost tribes of Israel. Jesus didn't go to the Gentiles. Jesus went to his own nation. And he ministered to them. That doesn't mean that he only wanted to save them. You could read Luke 4, for instance, and see that that wasn't the case. You could read John 4 and see that that was never the intent. But he did go to them first and foremost because the message had to go to them first and foremost. And it did. So Acts 3 is an example of them going to the temple. They go to the temple where the Jews were, and they preach the gospel to the Jews. Remember, we're in Acts 6 right now, and we still have exclusively a Jewish church. We have a Jewish background congregation. So when, this, uh, when the guy in that video, he had said that first century Christians considered themselves Jews, well, they considered that as their lineage. Absolutely they did. But that doesn't mean that they kept the Jewish uh, obligations under the law. They understood that the Torah and all of its elements were done away with in the cross of Christ, Colossians 2 and verse 4. And see, I've got a question about something like this, and it's the same question that we posed, uh, that was posed to these 80, 70 guys. And the question is this. You know, if the law was binding after the cross, why didn't Peter keep the law? Oh, well, Peter did keep the law. Acts 10 is an example. Is it? Well, Galatians 2, he asked Peter, he rebukes him. Paul rebukes Peter and says, Why, if thou being a Jew, compellest them to live as do the Gentiles, if you yourself live as the Gentiles? Now, did Peter keep the law, yes or no? No, sir. If he kept it, why did Paul say he didn't? So was the law binding after the cross? Absolutely not. And when we say the cross, we mean the death of Christ and the institution of the new covenant. We say all of those things in a relatively same idea. But the fact remains that after the day of Pentecost, Jews were amenable to the gospel of Jesus, not the law of Moses. And when the Gentiles were to be included some years later in Acts 10, Gentiles were no longer amenable to uh, the, the system of patriarchy. They were amenable to the gospel of Christ. When it was made available to them, they were now amenable to it. And it's the only way they could be saved, Right? We'll get to that as we get to Acts 10. Anybody looking forward to Acts 10? I love that chapter. It's full of good stuff. Cornelius was a good man, wasn't he? He was a good man. He was a just man. But he still needed saving, didn't he? All right. Acts 4. The church has gone to the Jewish community first and foremost. The church is growing. They're preaching the gospel to this Jewish community and now they're already facing persecution. I put a post, post up on Facebook 
uh, just a little while ago as I was doing some more reading this afternoon. And I find this fascinating. In Acts 18, as Paul is in Corinth, anybody ever heard of Corinth? Have you ever heard the saying uh, to be Corinthianized? They, they say that, and they say that in a way in which there was such licentiousness, such debauchery, such wickedness. Well, just imagine ancient Greece, right? Everything you can imagine and more. All kinds of pedophilia, all kinds of sexual anarchy, all kinds of uh, pagan uh, sexual blending of these temple worships of Diana, these kind of things. You had this idea. But in Corinth in Acts 18 and verses 8 and 9, Jesus says to Paul, go ahead and preach. I have many people here. Where? In Corinth. You know he spent a year and a half there preaching, verse 11? But do you know in Acts 22 and verse 18, when Paul is in Jerusalem, you know what he says? Get on out. They're not going to listen to you about me here. In Jerusalem. Isn't that the, the, the centerpiece of Judaism, essentially? J Jerusalem. When the temple fell in AD 70, wasn't that God symbolizing the absolute end in every way of Judaism, his complete abrogation of it in every detail, even the, the, the concept of the, the you, couldn't, you couldn't be a priest after the records were destroyed. It's totally gone. Of course it was gone at, at, uh, as Christ died on the cross and as he instituted the new covenant. But this was his symbolizing it's wiped out. You imagine Jesus, a Jew, being rejected by the Jews more vehemently than even the pagan Gentiles? We see that all the time. You know what? You know what's hard to do in the United States? Evangelism. It's hard. It's hard to get people to respond to the gospel here. But head on over to Kenya. Go to the Philippines where Samson is. Go to India where we support Vibraham and Joshua. You know what they do every day? Baptize honest, sincere people. You know why? Things are harder there. When things are harder, you think a little different. We've got so much here, we're fat and happy. Nobody cares. Nobody wants to give up. Oh, well, God wants me to restrain my behavior. I'd rather do my own thing. Same thing here. The Jews were one of the most vehement oppressors of Christianity in the first century. Christianity had two originally, right? Jews and then Rome. Vehement opposition. So you can understand as they preach the gospel in Acts 4, they're persecuted by their own countrymen, the Jews. Acts 5, we know the inner workings of the church. Um, uh, an activity or a, a chapter permeated with miraculous activity, right? We've talked about that. All right, in Acts 6, we'll just peruse through these first few verses and we'll comment again on verse 6. It says, In the times, uh, in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word, that is, the preaching of the word, to serve tables. Verse 3, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, and whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose all of these men, and primarily the focus is going to be on Stephen. All right? Verse 6 says, Whom, speaking of the men, they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. Okay. Prayer accompanied these activities in the first century. And I'm just going to give you two examples. In Acts 13, verse 2, it says, And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. Do you see how these ceremonies, these activities, where uh, you had, uh, whether it was the impartation of spiritual gifts or some of these other things that this first century church did, it was almost always accompanied by prayer. Is that a good thing? Sounds pretty good. So far, so good. Acts 28, 7. This is Paul getting to Rome. In the same quarters were possessions uh, of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. Do you see how uh, these disciples were so zealous and sincere that they always wanted to articulate their intent to God of whatever was going on, even though... God already knew. You could also understand that when he would pray this prayer, he would pray it very likely in the ear of these individuals that were there, and they would see, uh, they would hear what he say and then says and then see what happens because of it. 
Again, what was the purpose of the miracles in the first century? Confirmation of the guy preaching. Essentially, that's the purpose, right? Prayer's powerful, isn't it? I'm going to give you a few examples of that. Colossians 1 and verse 9, Paul would say, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul tells those that he's writing to uh, in the book of Colossians, we're praying for you. You know what you see on Facebook all the time? Prayer requests. People believe in prayer, don't they? Even denominational folks believe in prayer. That's a biblical concept. Prayer is powerful. Paul would say in 1 Thessalonians 5.25, Brethren, pray for us. You know, I find this interesting. Have you ever thought about it? Paul was an inspired apostle who was receiving direct revelation from God and he still solicited the prayers of the average Joe brother. Prayer is pretty powerful, isn't it? Because when you get down to it, there's no such thing as an average Joe brother, is there? Not in God's sight. The prayer of the faithful is powerful, James says in James 5. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course. Why did Paul request this if prayer didn't work? Hebrews 13, 18, Pray for us that we... Uh, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. Notice the solicitations constantly for prayer. You want to know how powerful prayer is? <clears throat> 1 John 5, 16 says, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, a sin not unto death is a sin that he will repent of. Listen to what he says. He shall ask, and he, that is God, shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. He says there is a sin unto death. That is an unrepentant sin. And he says do not pray for that one because it ain't going to work. But if I see a brother sin and that brother says, and you know, and you, you rebuke him or he realizes what he did. Oh, brother, I can't believe I did that. Will you, will you offer prayer for me? God says absolutely I'll forgive him. That's how powerful prayer is. Prayer changes things, doesn't it? Remember Daniel? As Daniel is praying, and he is praying after he understood by the words of Jeremiah that the captivity would last 70 years, and he's praying that his brethren, the, the, those in captivity, will be released. And you just wonder in God's foreknowledge, and you know Daniel was going to pray that prayer, and did that affect God's decision in the first place to make it 70 years? Getting a little deep there, aren't you? But the point is, God knew good and well Daniel was praying for it, and as the angel was sent to Daniel, he would say, Thou art greatly beloved. When Jeremiah would pray, when Micaiah would pray, when these prophets would pray, when Hezekiah would pray as he's confronted with the armies of Assyria, and you have Isaiah saying, Thy prayer has been heard. That is comforting. Remember, prayer is given for our benefit. Prayer is not so that God will learn anything new or understand what we want since he already knows. Prayer is for our benefit that we can find comfort in asking and we can demonstrate our faith by asking and believing that God will grant it. All right, they laid their hands on them. <clears throat> now, if you will turn in your Bibles to Acts 8. Acts 8. You see a lot of interesting things nowadays. You see denominational churches who will take a phrase like this, laid their hands on them, and they will impart that as some kind of ceremony in a, in a, in a service today. And they don't really understand what they're doing. And I've even heard of brethren, for whatever reason, that would try to incorporate some of these same silly concepts into some kind of worship service, trying to heal some man of some malady. And it's not going to work. Because that has nothing to do with us today. It had everything to do with them then. For instance, in James 5, the anointing of oil with the elders of the church. You know what it says in that context? It says, the prayer of faith will save him. I know for a fact that a congregation prayed for my Uncle Jim when he had leukemia and they anointed him with oil and prayed with him and guess what happened? He still died. The Bible says he will be saved. He will have his life restored. Not he may. He will. The prayer of faith was a miraculous concept. Not for us today. Same thing here. The entire purpose of laying on of hands by the apostles was an impartation of a spiritual gift. That was the entire purpose. Acts 8, if you look at verse 14. <clears throat> Acts 8, again, is when, because of the persecution, 
The church goes abroad except for the apostles and Philip goes into Samaria, right? And he takes the gospel to Samaria. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John. Why did they send Peter and John? Well, keep reading. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Wait a minute. Why did they need Peter and John to, to receive the Holy Ghost? I thought you received the Holy Ghost as soon as you're baptized. Well, consider the possibility that you thought wrong. Right? Why didn't they receive him? Were they Christians, yes or no? Wait, 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 wait a minute now. Were they Christians or weren't they? You know what Acts 8 4 says? Acts 8 4 says that they, uh, the church was scattered abroad and they went everywhere and they were going to preach. Acts 8 5, they were going to preach. Acts 8 12, they were going to preach. What they preach? They preached the word. They preached Christ. They preached Christ in his kingdom. Now I'm going to ask you another question. Were those in Samaria saved when they obeyed the gospel, yes or no? Well, then why didn't they receive the Holy Spirit? Because there is no receiving of the Holy Spirit apart from miraculous activities. Who, when they prayed, they came down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 16, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord. you know what baptized in the name of the Lord means? Baptized by the authority of Christ. That's exactly what Peter said in Acts 2. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. That's by his authority for the remission of sins. <clears throat> so they obeyed the gospel. They were saved. They were in a saved state. They were in the kingdom. No Holy Spirit. Verse 17. Then they laid their hands on them and they received who now? They received the Holy Ghost. And again, when you, when you read a phrase like receiving the Holy Ghost, understand figures of speech. This is metonymy. This doesn't mean that they actually received the Holy Ghost. It means that they received power or gifts from Him. <clears throat> Acts 19, if you'll turn there, we got another example. Verse 2, Paul's in Ephesus. And because of the teaching of Apollos, you had some of the disciples in Ephesus that were taught information that was out, out of date, right? They were only taught about John's baptism and John was saying that Christ is going to come and when He comes, look for Him. Well, John... Uh, uh, had uh, died already and Jesus had already come. He had lived and he had died and he had been resurrected. Well, he had already come so the information they were given was outdated information, right? And he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Now, why did he ask that? Hey guys, have you received the non-miraculous personal indwelling that does absolutely nothing apart from the Word of God? Have you received that? Well, No. Is that what he's talking about? Or is he asking if these disciples have miraculous revelation and they're able to also uh, um, uh, uh, do some kind of a miraculous activity that would confirm what it would be they would teach? Which one? Ask yourself that, please. They said, I don't know what you're talking about. We've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. What are you talking about? And he said unto them, Under what were you baptized? And they said, John's baptism. And then Paul says, he explains to them, John baptized with baptism of repentance to the nation of Israel. John's baptism was for the Jews. Very likely these folks in Ephesus weren't Jews. Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after Christ already came. That's the wrong information. Acts 19 is the best argument on this planet for why we do not accept denominational baptism. Do you know who baptizes for the remission of sin? The Mormons. Should you accept them into fellowship? Why? They're taught all kinds of garbage before they, they're dipped in water, aren't they? They're taught all kinds of polluted doctrine. They don't teach them the truth. The truth, in order for it to be a valid baptism, there had to be kind of an understanding of what's going on. Yes, Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, I believe He came to save me from my sins. Yes, I understand that He has, uh, when I obey this gospel, I'm not in the world anymore, anymore but I'm, I'm part of His church, His kingdom. If you don't believe that they taught about the kingdom before they baptized, read Acts 8.12 and Acts 28.31. They taught the kingdom of God. That's the church. Do you think they just said, hey guys, you obey the gospel and then just meet with these guys every once in a while, but you're not really a part of anything. You've gone from condemnation into light, but I'm not going to describe that light in any way. You've gone from lost to found. You were in the kingdom of darkness. Now you're just, you know, you're floating. No, you're in the kingdom of God. They told him that. We should too. 
All right. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's that phrase again by the authority. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them. What happened when the Holy Ghost came on them? Nothing silly. It's a non-miraculous personal indwelling. Is it? What'd they do? Well, it says they spake with tongues and prophesied. You mean to tell me that the Holy Ghost imparted spiritual gifts into them and the only way the Holy Ghost was received by men in the first century was by the laying on of apostles' hands and this was a miraculous context? Sure. That's absolutely the truth. Do you know what we assume? We assume otherwise, don't we? Well, I've always thought that when you're baptized, you receive. I thought that too. I thought it was an automatic thing. It's not. The Bible just doesn't teach that. Leave that stuff behind. That's not what the Bible teaches. This is what the Bible teaches. Does God dwell in us today? Certainly he does. You know what John 14, 23 says? Jesus tells his disciples, if you'll keep my word, my Father and I will come and make our abode with you. You know what John 15 says? If you abide in me, I'll abide in you. Do you know how we abide in Christ? Verse 10 says, keeping his commandments. When we abide in Christ, he abides in us. Is that true? Sure it is. Is it literal? No. Does the Holy Spirit dwell in us today? Certainly he does. Is it literal? No. He influences us through his inspired word. That's how he dwells in us. 2 Timothy 1. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which was in thee by the putting on of my hands. Paul tells Timothy... I gave you, what was that now? The gift of God. I'm going to ask you a question. Does the gift of the Holy Ghost in Acts 2.38 mean that the Holy Ghost is a gift? That's what everybody thinks. I'm going to ask you that same question right here. Does the gift of God in 2 Timothy 1.6 mean that God is the gift? Yes or no? He's telling him to stir up that spiritual gift that Paul gave him by laying on of hands. It's called the gift of what now? It's the gift of God. It doesn't mean that God's the gift, but it's a gift from God. That same phrase in Acts 8 is spoken of as the impartation of spiritual gifts in that context also. Peter says it was a gift of the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 10. Same thing he says in Acts 2. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel According to the power of God. Paul laid hands on Timothy and he received the, the, a spiritual gift. What was the primary purpose? What was the purpose of laying on of hands by apostles? Impartation of spiritual gifts. In a time in which miraculous activity was going on, that's not today. <clears throat> right? Fundamentally, we must understand, and we're going to look at that right now. <clears throat> Zechariah chapter 13. If you, if you want to turn there real quick, we're almost done. Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13 and verse 2 says this, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts. He says in verse 1 that there would be a fountain open in Jerusalem for uncleanness. Anybody want to take a shot at what that was? Matthew 26 and verse 28. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Jesus' blood was shed for the remission of sins, right? And the institution of the new covenant, salvation was possible for men. That's what he's talking about. And he was saying, it'll come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I shall cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall do, uh, be no more remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirits to pass out of the land. <clears throat> now does that not give us an idea that at some point God was going to be done with this? I will cause them to pass out of the land. Look at verse 3. And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy... Then his father and his mother that begat him will say unto him, You're a liar. I know you're a liar because God says that there's no more miraculous activity. There was a time in which God says, I will stop that. Now he doesn't specifically say when, does he? All right, well, let's keep going. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 8 says, Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, listen to this, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, listen, they shall cease. People practicing these things today are not actually doing what they claim to do. Some of them are sincere. Some of them are not. 
those sincere ones are caught up in the moment. They've, they've been told these things and they think it's the best thing since sliced bread and they think they're doing wonderful things. But they're mis they're, they misunderstand. Listen to what he says. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Now let me ask you something. Why do people think that that which is perfect is Jesus? You know why? Because the word perfect is used. Do you know what the word perfect means in this context in the Greek? It means mature. That's what it means. Complete. Mature. When that which is complete is come, what did he say in verse 9? We know in part. What's the context of this knowing? It is the knowledge God revealed through these inspired men. A prophet didn't prophesy everything, right? He prophesied some things. When you had a spiritual gift, it revealed some information, but it didn't reveal all of it. But there would be a time in which the totality would be completely revealed and there would be no need for these impart gifts. That's exactly what he's talking about here. I don't want you to take my word for it. What I want you to do is turn to Ephesians 4. And let's look at this one. As we close, Ephesians 4. <clears throat> you can see the seven ones, right? Verses 4 through 7 or so. You can see the gifts given by Christ beginning right around verse 8. You can see when these gifts were given. That is when he ascended on high. Now I'd like for you to compare that to Acts chapter 2. Therefore being on the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost... That is when he ascended on high. That's how they knew he was on the right hand of God because he sent this power to them. So he says, He that descended is also same uh, uh, that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Listen to this word. Till. Anybody ever say that? It's, it's short for until, right? We use slang sometimes, till. This word sets a point of terminus or termination. This says, this is going to come up, this is going to continue until this. This is not the same word uh, that is used in other contexts showing that it's still okay to continue afterwards. This is a word that absolutely says this is a terminating point. It will not go beyond. Until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Isn't that the same word used in 1 Corinthians 13, 10? Perfect. Unto the measure of the fullness or the stature of the fullness of Christ. Oh, well, you might say, well, there's not unity even today, so it must still be going on. That's not what it means. It's talking about the, the full revelation was given so that there could be unity. It's up to you to be unified. God has provided the information needed for it. He's provided every bit of it. Peter would say in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3 that through the apostles, every scrap of information that was necessary has been given. Through them, all things that pertain to life and godliness have been given through this revelation. And there is nothing that has not been given. Therefore, there is no need for spiritual gifts. John, it was only about 40 minutes. I probably could go for another 40, but we're going to stop right there. Again, thank you for, for being here. We appreciate your attention. I'd like to extend the invitation at this time. Are there any here tonight that have never obeyed the gospel? The Bible says you must hear the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing God's word, not my thoughts. Right? I, must, I can believe in Jesus Christ, John 20 and verse 31, through his inspired word. I do not need any other book. I just need the Bible. I must repent of my sins because the Lord obligates me to do so. Acts 17, 30. I must confess Christ as king of my life. Romans 10, 10 because it goes toward salvation. And I must be baptized for the remission of my sins. Acts 22, 16, Acts 2, 38. That's when I contact the blood. And that's when I request a clean conscience from God. By simply doing what he said to do. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. And I must continue in faithfulness. I must understand God's will. Ephesians 5, 17. And make application in my life. Walking in his light. And as I do, I have the cleansing blood of Christ. And access to it. For those who have obeyed the gospel, are you not faithful? Come back. Repent. Repent of your sin, just like we read earlier in 1 John 5, 16. God's going to forgive you if you're willing to repent. Acknowledge it in prayer to Him. Turn away from that sin and do better, and He will forgive you. You have assurances of that. If you need our prayers, we'll pray for you.
We're going to sing this imitation song as we do. If any have need, please come now as we stand and sing.